Uh, hi, everybody. My name is Robert. Uh, on Twitter, I'm I am Lay. Uh, you guys can all harass me. Feel free to harass me during this talk. Uh, the best harassment will win a prize. Uh, I'm going to be talking a little bit about privacy today. It was supposed to be uh, more of a history lesson, but today it's, it's, I changed it after the, the release of uh, some papers in the last month. And I'm going to be talking a lot about spacey state surveillance technology and how you can detect and defend against that idea. Ooh, this is a long reach. Uh, again, this is who I am. My name is Robert, speaker, uh, kind of an advocate type of thing. I do research as my primary job. Uh, I'm part of a Irvine Underground group, which is kind of local, and I enjoy the WASPs groups. So you guys, could, uh, you guys might see me around. Uh, quick breakdown. I only have 20, 30 minutes, so I'm just going to quickly run through uh, the series of bugs, basically the technology that they're using, hardware, software, Wi-Fi stuff, cell phone tracking. I'm going to go through the defenses in line and then end it all off with a base, basic conclusions as to what I feel and what I hope everybody takes away from this. So most of this has started off because of the uh, surveillance sky mall leaks is like what I, I like, what, that's what I like to call it. These were the leaks that Jacob Applebaum released via Der Spiegel uh, during the CCC conference last month. It was a series, uh, basically, it, it looked like the SkyMog catalog, like with NSA agents and G GCHQ would basically turn around and like order each individual little bug that they wanted to, to order to do spying. And uh, I got a lot of press. Uh, I watched the talk, I uh, found it interesting, but I felt as if it lacked some component, uh, an actual usable component for anybody to walk away from. It was a lot of hearsay, a lot of uh, jibber jabber saying this is bad stuff happening, bad stuff's happening, but nothing that was actually tangible. And this is what I really wanted to see. So that's why. I, I wanted to put together this talk, which kind of uh, associates itself with that one, because this is the stuff that I wanted to see somebody actually release. Because uh, if there's a bug, there's a physical presence of the bug. So starting off, these are the series of bugs that are called basically retro reflectors. Think of them kind of like a, a little radar device or basically like an RFID tag, sort of. These are little things that were built in line to either, you know, uh, it's, well, they're called Surly Spawn Loud Audio Rage Master, but they're built into like your VGA cables. Maybe they're just a bug that was installed in the room that runs off of a, a battery, and they would just listen on a microphone and reamplify it over an RF signal to, a, to a, basically a little base station that they have that will pull the data off. These are physical bugs, though. I felt... <laughs> And uh, I felt like his talk should have been talking about here I actually found one. And here's some hard evi evidence as to what it, how it works. So it, it's pretty easy to defend against a physical bug, especially something that sends an RF frequency. So you can just literally uh, you know, put tinfoil all around your office. And uh, so this would be the, the first solution that I would pr provide. And I'm, I'm not seeing it, but really all you guys should be uh, face palming. Uh, there you go. <laughs> really bad slide alteration. None of the things that I actually would should talk about, and you guys should be like throwing basically like schmoo balls at me, saying I'm a jackass for coming up here, saying everybody should be wearing tinfoil hats. None of the solutions that I provide are things like this. The the problem with an idea like this, like tinfoil, or I should say the the tinfoil, or uh, the solutions were like a uh, Faraday cage to prevent anybody from listening into what's going on is that you're assuming and you're actually accepting the idea that the, the spying is taking place. And yes, theoretically, if that had happened, yes, you would have been preventing it, but you'd have no idea to verify if that was happening. So you're basically sticking yourself, you know, be, you're, being, you're causing the problem yourself. The, span, the, the attack might, may or may not exist, but the fact that you would go out and do a defense that doesn't actually detect anything, and then especially if you turn around and, and proclaim it as fact and say, oh, I, I have a Faraday caged laptop, uh, you know, no, nobody, no, none of the spying agencies will ever get the data off of it. You know, bad BIOS will never happen to this laptop. But the problem is you don't actually have evidence of it. And there's ways to detect that actual evidence. Uh, for RF bug detection, the way to do it would be to actually get software-defined de software radio, a device like this, uh, the HackRF board by, by Michael Osman. Go get one of those. They're about 300 bucks. The Kickstarter just finished. And they're actually being produced. Uh, this is this is basically high end, but for the high end best best uh, device you can get, uh, software defined radio device to listen to anything from 10 megahertz up to 6 gigahertz, you'll be able to li listen to that data, and then you'll actually be able to see, oh, I physically have the RF frequencies pinging right now, and you would verify it by physically unplugging the device because, like your VGA cable, if it was a bug that was in line to the VGA cable, things like that, you physically unplug it and see if that RF pinging stopped. Now you have evidence. Now you actually have tangible evidence that you can go forward and go public and say, this is the tangible evidence that I have. As opposed to majority of the problem during the whole Dragos bad bios thing, a lot of people were freaking out. It's very good to catch headlines, but the problem is there was no, 
There's no documents that said, here are the actual frequencies, here's some data that I actually pulled off of it. And that's what I felt it kind of lacked. It kind of fell forward and basically fell on itself and it was a bad representation of things. And this same thing with the, these theoretical bugs is that unless somebody comes forth and says, here's actual evidence, here's actual RF frequency that I, I picked up, uh, I, I, I personally don't believe it and I think it's something that's basically disheartening towards a whole community. It looks bad for everybody. But going on, different types of hardware bugs. Uh, they're known as cotton mouth Ginsu. That's not actually a picture of Ginsu. That's a, RF, that's a Wi-Fi card with a Ginsu knife. Uh, Firewalk how Howler Monkey. These are all different ways. They, they, these ones exfiltrated data, not using RF frequencies, but using basically uh, for cotton mouth it was USB. It would, it would be a bug that jammed itself into the USB Firewalk. It's a little bug that it fixed itself to your Ethernet card. Ginsu was a Wi-Fi card. Howler Monkey was just kind of like the chips that they use, uh, basically a chipset that they would use. All of these share a common theme. Uh, these are all physical devices that, that change your physical device. So it, it would be for Firewalk or Cottonmouth, it would be you know, your USB or your, your uh, Ethernet card, and now there's a physical device that's added onto it. I think this is even better because most of us should know what these things should look like, especially you know, a USB cable or, or your, your Ethernet card, and you can see when there's been physical tampering. And I believe that somebody should have turned around and said, you know, there's what it is. Um, or here's that bug that I found. It was, it was attached to my motherboard. Um, going on, there is another series of, I stopped doing pictures because I got, I got tired of it. Uh, there's another series of persistent compromised devices. These are things that would basically, they would infect your, your, um, for God search. This was a device that was plugged into the JTAG port on a, on a Dell PowerEdge servers. It got very popular. You can plug into JTAG ports. Who here knows what JTAG does is for? It's basically a debug of like two of you guys. And the guy with Google Glass is the other one. Um, it is the it basically it's the port uh, on your bio or on your motherboard that you can do use for debugging directly to the CPU. Uh, it's used a lot in hacks and and, uh, and things like that. You can pull data off your routers really nice and easily. It's about it's your debugging purpose port, so you can get all the data off the router really easily. But it turns out they just use it for persistent compromised port because well you get direct access to the CPU, you can just dump all the data on there directly. Don't even have to worry about your your OS. Um, and the rest of these series, uh, JetPlow, the the water, the head Halux water, or the school Sierra Stucco, these are all devices that would uh, be persistent compromised for routers, things like that. They'd be again a physical device is plugged into into your router or into your BIOS or on on the motherboard, and people should be turning around right now and kind of looking at them and saying, "Hey, this is what I found." So for those of you who aren't familiar with JTAG. On the left, that's what a JTAG port looks like when it, when it doesn't have any pins. They can have pins, about 14 pins. Uh, that's, pre, pre, that's before it's uh, uh, basically put pins in. On the bottom is another example. It doesn't have to be JTAG. There's a, it's a, another header called XDP. It's a similar to JTAG. It's used for uh, just a, basically a different series of motherboards. Uh, and there's a big, long list of potential things. What you see on the right is something, probably a really bad example. <laughs> this is an actual compromise, but this is just somebody who plugged in a... a, a a board to their JTAG headers, and that's what it would look like. It would be somebody plugged in a device. So everybody here knows what their a motherboard should look like, and you should be able to detect when something doesn't exist because every wire on motherboard is typically going to be uh, on the PCB traces. It's all going to be PCB traces. There are going to be exposed wires that can reconnect things. We're not playing with Apple IIs here. And it's pretty easy to, I mean, I think everybody should be able to open up the case and actually look if you think you're being surveilled by the state uh, uh, actors, uh, you can all see probably something here doesn't belong. And that's about what you're looking for. You're looking for everything looks normal, everything's a PCB trace. Now there's suddenly some wires and a little dongle device that you don't know, or a, a bottle of bleach in the, in the refrigerator. Uh, there are also software exploits. Obviously, software exploits aren't going to work the same as hardware exploits when you detect them. But so in this case, Swap and Irate Monk are devices, or basically, firm, I think they're firmware uh, compromises for hard drives, and Wistful and Deity Bounce are software exploits for for other basically uh, motherboard BIOSes. Uh, in in these, since you're not going to be able to physically detect them, uh, it's actually a really simple solution if you honestly do think and you're wearing a tinfoil hat, uh, you can just reflash your device. <laughs> Uh, and you don't, I don't want to hear anybody complain about how there's a potential. But you can also pull the, pull the image off the device and then inspect the image directly. If you get an image from the manufacturer and you pull an image off the device and they are different, now you have something that's tangible and you can release it and tell everybody, hey, I actually found this thing. Even if you don't understand how to decompile it, you can say, hey, it's different and just give it up to the community and other people that have the time and expertise will decompile a BIOS and say, oh, this is what I think is happening. As opposed as opposed to just claiming that it happened and not, provo not providing any evidence. 
Um, now, Wi-Fi tags are actually really simple. There, there, there were two that were released in the, in the catalog. One was Sparrow. It's kind of neat. It, it connects to a UAV, so it connects to a drone. And then Nightstand. Nightstand is this big box, like a Pelican case with a laptop inside. It's kind of funny uh, because the Hack 5 Pineapple is probably more, <laughs> honestly, probably more cool than these things. Uh, it probably does more as well. And everybody who's been around at these to a, one conference, probably there was a talk on it here. I didn't check the schedule, but you shouldn't understand how to, how to do Wi-Fi basic compromises, and that's how these devices will work. If you know how to do the Wi-Fi compromises, you know how to look for, for things going weird with your Wi-Fi devices with, that you're connecting to. Uh, basically, all the same, all the same arguments will still still exist. Getting into the fun one, the uh, cell phone bugs. There were kind of two series of, of types of bugs that they were using. A lot of them were like a, an actual cell phone device, and a lot of it was used for tracking people. So if you were given a, a cell phone, or basically your cell phone was taken by somebody, they could track where you are using the base stations if you had this infected cell phone. But turns out how cell phones work is they connect to towers anyways, and everybody with a cell phone should already be aware that if you, since they know what towers that you connect to, they know where you are especially with GPS on cell phones. Uh, this should not be a surprise to anything, and this, has, this is like, it's quite surprising to see this on a list of things that we can track people's cell phones, and we're so great because we have this great technology, but in fact, that's basically ingrained into every cell phone right now. Uh, but there's other stuff. There were a lot of uh, malicious, uh, basically GSM, uh, rogue base stations, and that was, this is a big concern because now instead of you connecting to the legitimate tower, via your, your service provider, you'll be connecting to the malicious towers that they've installed. This was released in DEF CON a number of years ago, uh, GSM stuff, basically GSM base station hacking. Uh, it was at, not this year, but previous years DEF CON, they actually had their own, own rogue cell network. At other events, they always have rogue cell networks. They're actually a, a thing now, they don't cost too much money to put together, and all this is is basically, with six or seven different names, they're all the exact same thing. It's a GSM base station that you can plug in and people's cell phones will connect to it because cell phones will happily connect to whatever closest service provider they can find for their, for their radio frequency. For this, uh, for this attack, I actually came up with a, a basic idea and I'm putting together the code for it. It's called Tower Canary. Uh, it would just be an Android app that looks for your local uh, cell phone towers and tells you whenever there's a change. Obviously, you can't turn up a rogue base station without showing up on a, a list of towers that are available. So when a new tower shows up at your home or your office, this uh, program will just simply go, bloop, there's a new tower. I don't know where it came from, but it was, wasn't here yesterday. So either your, your service provider is turning up new towers, which you can probably see, or, uh, or something new is weird is happening. This probably has a very limited audience, since this would be, since if you were to travel while this app is running, it will tell you every time there's a new base station because you've traveled to a new one. But let's say theoretically you're some guy might be, uh, you know, being held in an embassy, South, South, some South American em uh, country's embassy, and you're kind of stuck in one location. So I got, I got at least one person that needs this. <laughs> and instead of that person turning around and saying, I think that they're do using rogue base stations near this embassy, they could actually run a program like this because every cell phone has the ability to associate itself with, with different towers. And uh, in the Android platform, I know already that you can easily pull the information from each tower that's available. So it's one function call. You just basically call it and it gives you a list of all the cell towers that are currently available and information about, basic information about that tower. So doing things like that are far, far more beneficial, again, to the community to say, this is what we did. I, yes, I'm stuck in this area, and now suddenly at my office there was a new cell phone tower. Even if the rogue cell tower existed and it went away, they're like, well, it was there, and then it stopped being there. So I don't know what happened with that. So the... Typically, cell phone providers aren't running around turning up t uh, cell towers and then tearing them down and putting them up and putting them down, so that looks a little bit weird. Uh, so the whole conclusion on this is I really wanted to give out the information because it seemed, especially when I, when I uh, talk to people online about it, like on Reddit threads, like a lot of their responses regards to the whole talk that exposed what these bugs were was that it was now up to the community to find the bugs, and then it's not up to the individual who reported all of them to verify that those things actually existed, uh, mind you. Uh, but to me, I felt like, well, no, he actually should be going out and finding those people. If the person who was reporting this was a person who may or may not claim that they've been a, 
uh, investigated and tracked by the U.S. and other various or government organizations. Perhaps they have one of these bugs installed on one of their devices. Perhaps they could order a laptop and see if it came with a bunch of new shit added to it. Just let let, let them, you know, basically buy into it. But none of that happened. I I kind of felt as if he was at a loss when when that when that presentation was given. Uh, hard evidence always better than hearsay. I honestly do get kind of tired when a lot of people claim things. A lot of people that wear tinfoil hats come around and they say that somebody's spying on them because they've got a uh, billionaire is, is, is spying on them and hired a private investigator. This is actually a story that I heard. <laughs> Somebody had a private investigator that was following them and they knew because they stopped at a stoplight and they turned right and the guy in the other car looked at them. And they knew that was the private investigator. And that's just frankly, I get tired <laughs> of hearing those people. Thank you. But tinfoil hats are not stylish. Nobody should be wearing them. This one is very cool. This one, this one was a, a friend's creation. I guess if you are going to be crazy, at least might as well put some effort into it. Uh, <laughs> now that you've told me it's going to work that way, it channels them. Uh, also, mind you, too, the leaks, I didn't mention this earlier, the leak source for the uh, Sky Mall, all the documents for the NSA Sky Mall or the GCHQ Sky Mall thing, the leak source was not Snowden. A lot of people like to associate the two things because they feel that the Snowden leaks were really strong. The leak source was a site, a site called leaksource.files.wordpress.com. I don't know. They should add Tumblr and Blogspot. But that's where you can actually download and get information about those leaks. I don't know who that leak source is. So honestly, I feel as if all of the information that was released in those leaks might actually all be misinformation or just bullshit that some guy made up because that's the best he could think up. Uh, in any case, I do. I don't. I discredit because I don't see any evidence of it. What's happening? But I do enjoy that leak because I feel as if it was a good thought. It's a good thought experiment for a lot of people. You know, you can think that, oh, well, yeah, of course they could do that. Uh, there were the BIOS hacks in the in the hardware or basically hard drive firmware that was released at CCC last year. But it's again, it's it's basically re-released. It's 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 a good way. It's a good thought experiment for a lot of people. You maybe you want to think about what what you're doing, and if you genuinely do think that you're being uh, monitored and stuff, go look, and now you can verify if you're being monitored or not, and you can sleep better at night. Uh, again, you know, it, there's some sources here. Michael Osman, that was the place to get the HackRF board. Uh, Bruce Schneier talks a lot about this stuff, and there's uh, you can harass me on basically on Twitter. Tell me, tell me I'm crazy. And I think I got a couple tweets here, and I got a couple more minutes. I got two new interactions. I'm going to see. Oh, I've tested a Tower Canary and Pwn Pad phone phone. All right, it's just D Schwartzberg. All right, we can talk. <laughs> and I need a high gain amplifier for the hat. 